Uh, we have uh, Sylvia Castro, who is the executive director of the Suazo Business Center. Sylvia, raise your hand. Nice to see you. Uh, we have Phil Dean, who's the, the co-chair of the Utah Economic Council and uh, someone who has lent amazing service to the state and I'm happy to say is now a public finance senior research fellow at the Kim Gardner Institute. <laughs> nice to have you, Phil. We have Sophia DeCaro, who is uh, executive director of the Governor's Office of Management and Budget, and Dan Hemmert, executive director of the Governor's Office of Economic Development. Thank you four for joining us. <laughs> yeah, let's give them a hand. <laughs> So, uh, Dan, I'm going to start with you. I, I thought just, I didn't have to answer any questions. I know, I know. And I, I told these people kind of what to expect, and now I've mixed it all up, so let's have fun here. But, uh, Dan, you've got this new uh, stewardship of the Utah economy, and I just want you real briefly to, dis to describe your vision for, for GoEd and for the Utah economy. Well, stewardship for the Utah economy is probably a very, very way too big of a term, but um, <laughs> definitely... Uh, you know, as far as vision with uh, the Governor's Office of Economic Development, um, there's a few things we want to reorient toward. And in particular, entrepreneurship, uh, reorient toward homegrown businesses. We have a, a very dynamic entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem here. And I think we can facilitate and try to assist with that nice. and be more of a resource there than we have been in the past. Um, and that comes from your background as, as, as someone who's done a lot of entrepreneurial work. Yeah. I'm assuming, yeah. Yes. Great. I mean, that is my background. It's, yeah. it's been, you know, CFO of a startup company that was successfully sold, uh, you know, owned a small business most recently and then been involved in uh, alternative asset management, including investing in, in startups yeah, and, and small businesses. So um, so that's one area that I do think we can work on. Um, our small businesses are going to need help. You know, your chart earlier mm -hmm. that showed where which industries have been negatively impacted, a big portion of that is small business. Mm -hmm. And small business still is the single largest employer by far, as far as a, a category of employers in the state of Utah. And they've been, they've been to a large degree the hardest hit, and they need, um, they just, they, they need to help navigating yeah. through the end of this pandemic, which I yeah, hope yeah. is around the corner. So small business entrepreneurship. Uh, Sophie, I'm gonna come to you with kind of the same question. You have uh, experience already in the governor's office of management budget. You've had experience at uh, at, at GoEd or the economic development. You've had private sector experience. You've been a state legislator. Now you've got the reins of the budget in the state. Uh, what's your vision? Uh, share with everyone what you're thinking. Uh, yeah. No. I first of all, I just want to say thank you. I think this is a great event, one that I look forward to every year. And 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 Natalie as well has done such a phenomenal job with the institute. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to uh, helping to position the office to better partner with the Institute in a lot of the research that uh, is being provided. Um, there's been a lot done uh, over the years in terms of uh, helping uh, efficiencies grow in state government, and I look forward to elevating those elements uh, to, to uh, position the state to be able to face the challenges that we're, we're having right now, but also to help shape the future of the state and uh, start uh, figuring out how we can utilize tools to help shape the future we want and be proactive in uh, taking advantages of opportunities that come our way. Love it, love it. Sylvia, you and I have had a lot of interaction over the past few months uh, working to help uh, with the state's economy. I've been so impressed with your knowledge of small business, uh, what the Suazo Business Center does. Uh, can you just react to what you just heard me share as the economic report and maybe with an emphasis on small business? As we have seen in the reports over and over again, small businesses have borne the brunt of the economic impact because of the pandemic. And as we look at economic recovery, small businesses are a huge part of that recovery and ensuring that it's successful to keeping the diversity, the tax diversity of the state. Um, I think we are looking at a lot of challenges. We had a lot of small businesses that had to um, change their operations, change the way they do business on a dime. And that takes money, that takes capital. And if it wasn't for all the federal funding that we had received, I know we probably would have been in um, worse shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Phil, um, you and I are peers in terms of our background and economic training and thoughts about the economy. I, I didn't make the point enough in my uh, presentation, but if I think about what's happened in the Utah economy of the past year, the term resiliency comes to mind. 
just an unbelievable performance during difficult times. Can you reflect on that? I know you're close enough to the data to share some interesting insights. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. I actually been thinking as, as you were presenting back to March when all of this, I'd heard about it in China and then in Italy, I remember. And, but the reality of that hitting in March just completely caught me off guard. And I remember some of the, the earlier feelings of, of just like sand shifting underneath the feet and, and not knowing what the future was gonna be. And certainly we, we still have significant challenges that, that we're dealing with, but if at that time you had said, would you take a 4% unemployment rate in the state of Utah? I would have said, I wasn't sure that was possible. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And would you take growth in many sectors of the economy by the end of the year? That's the situation that we're in now. Uh, the economy has proven to be very resilient. Uh, businesses adapted. Uh, they, they, they dealt with the challenges as they came. And it, it's fascinating, as you mentioned, the K-shaped recovery, where we do have businesses that, that I've heard from many that say this was their best year ever ever, ever, ever on record if you were dealing with uh, home improvement, garden type things, recreation, uh, RV sales, things like that. Absolutely fantastic year because people changed their consumption patterns. Uh, and you also have the other side of that, of, of many businesses experiencing their worst years because of, of mm -hmm. some of the challenge we, challenges we face with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Sylvia, I want to just stay with you on that point because uh, a big part of this K-shaped challenge is the multicultural community. Uh, you work with that community closely. What does this audience need to know about the hardship that's, that's been felt and what we need to be doing? It's interesting because this pandemic is not just a health crisis, but along with it, it's very tied to the economy. And as you see the data, not only do you see the impact health-wise when it comes to the minority population, but it's actually the exact same impact economically. If you look at the industries that were mostly affected um, by the pandemic, these are industries that are heavily owned by small businesses that are owned by minorities. So one of the things too, it's because of turning, uh, again, it's just to survive, it took a lot, it took a lot to figure out how to overnight service your customers digitally, how to overnight also move your operations digitally. And even though there were some resources available, keep in mind that a lot of these businesses, they have never probably dealt with debt before. They have never had to think strategically about changing their uh, operational model. And that takes help. That takes a lot of technical assistance help that um, there's a lot of specific nuances that the multicultural community deals with. There's different access to uh, digital tools, there's different knowledge, there's different business relationships that they don't have. They don't have a good, usually don't have a good accountant on hand or lawyers. So they do face a lot more challenges that most of the local, um, the other comparable uh, type of populations. But at the same time, one of the things that, um, that we do see is the resilience. Even though they have been thrown through everything, they still keep going, they still try. And I think that really speaks to uh, the resiliency and also their passion for what they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanna turn to both uh, Sophia and, and Dan, and I won't always lump you guys together, but given this um, multicultural disparity issue, Sophia, the, the governor's budget released uh, yesterday, uh, Dan, you've got you've been in the legislature and know about this issue. What 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 should the state be doing? Yeah, and, so, and is there something in the budget that you'd want to highlight? Sure, or? absolutely. So, uh, I once heard at a, a conference a while back that um, diversity inclusion. You can think of diversity as being invited to the party, and you can think of inclusion as being asked to dance. And uh, I thought that was really profound and uh, a good way to describe uh, the efforts and focus that this administration will have on elevating uh, the, the ethnic minority community as well as women and just uh, populations that have less access to opportunity. Uh, and you'll see that trickled out through, throughout the budget. 
uh, recommendations that were made available yesterday. Um, and and uh, so, yeah, we, I think uh, you'll see a concerted effort to add focus. Um, you'll see uh, 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 an administration that will also prioritize that in addition to budget. Uh, and you've seen that in terms of resource allocation and uh, just new assignments that are being made. Uh, so I think I think there's a, a recognition in, in seeing what we saw with the K-shape recovery. A lot of these areas, uh, not not just uh, multicultural, but also rural, uh, is part of that K-shape uh, issue that that we just looked at previously. And I think you'll see that uh, there will be a, a heavy focus on those those areas like rural and uh, multicultural community. Yeah, yeah. And Dan, please comment on that. Can I give you a short-term response? Yeah, please. You know, business owners, in particular, small business, multiculturally owned businesses, uh, they should go to coronavirus.utah.gov slash business. There is a rapid response team there available. Uh, there's multicultural, there's bilingual or alternate language resources available to small business owners to help assist them with the latest round of federal assistance in the latest uh, Paycheck Protection Program loan mm -hmm. to help these small businesses get access to capital to help them bridge the remainder of the pandemic. And that's, that's something that should be done immediately by small business owners and that should be pushed out to the you know, minority-owned businesses and uh, um, all, frankly all businesses. So. Yeah. Dan, I just want to say this, but uh, your department, I don't know how many um, days you've been on the job at this point, but... Uh, like six. Six. Go ahead, administered the bulk of these, um, you know, grants to help with small business, and a big thank you to your team, because, you know, if you think about it, and I, I'm going to invite anyone to comment on this, but if you think about it, we, we keep saying that Utah has fared better than, you know, any state economically during this, and, and we, it's, it's natural to ask why. Why has Utah done better economically? It, I want to hear your thoughts. Can I take yeah. a first stab yeah, of that? Yeah, please. Um, one is we have a very diverse economy. And okay. so going back to, you know, some are up, some are down. But there's something else we did that, that I think we can be proud of. And, it, you know, the, as you mentioned, the Governor's Office of Economic Development administered a lot of these business assistance programs um, where we used a significant portion of the CARES Act funding that came to the state so federal money coming federal in. Federal money mm -hmm. to support businesses. And I think that's the right way to look. Um, that money didn't go to prop up government. It went to prop up businesses. There's also significant support that went to renters, um, individual renters. There was significant support that went to ag industry, to the mining industry. And uh, I think we can be proud as a state that we got the money in the hands of businesses and individuals who most needed it. Yeah. Others to comment on on why uh, we have been as resilient as we have. Well, Natalie, I, I brought this up with me because nice. I just thought this this is such an excellent tool and such a great summary. And I always keep one on my desk. Um, and I think that a lot of what's in here can answer that question and highlight that question. But in here, you'll see that uh, that to Dan's point, we have a highly uh, diverse economy. Um, and we've had one of the smallest job contractions in here. Uh, and, and I think that uh, another thing that is unique to Utah is, uh, you know, I like to call it a big small town. It's, it's a big small town environment where when we go through challenges like this, we can get together, we can collaborate effectively because uh, the community is small. And I think that uh, is also a reason why we are able to be successful. Yeah. So uh, economic diversity, getting the funds to the quickly to the people that need it, and this uh, big small town the collaboration. Let's have the two of you comment on it as well. So I actually wanted to really thank what the Governor's Office of Economic Development has done. Because I think in the beginning, we were just, we were basically walking on the bridge that was getting built at the same time. Mm -hmm. But w the way people just came together and try to do things as fast as they could in a way to help all of us. It was just incredible, and I think it really speaks to the Utah values, that we look at how, as a community, can we come together and help where it's needed. Um, now, nowhere before have, um, have we seen the, just that kind of rapid interaction and rapid implementation and so many things. 
And even though there were some missteps, they were quickly we quickly learned from them and we figured it out. In, like for like just like um, Dan mentioned, we're looking at a multi and that this time for the rapid response team and also for the coronavirus that you did at Gov, we already have in place things to deal with the multicultural community, things that are in different languages. And we were able to put that together before Monday. And that's amazing. That's one of the things that I think really helps us as a state, besides, of course, the diversity of industries, but I think just, um, just the sheer amount of collaboration, not just from government, local chambers, the Salt Lake Chamber, local institutions, that we all have this deep care for our community, and we all come in and just say, how do we do this together? Yeah, thank you, Sylvia. Phil, bring us home on this question. Yeah, so two things I want to bring up. One, it's kind of been mentioned in different ways, but this social cohesion that we have here in the state. Uh, I think you've called it before the special sauce that yeah. we have here. And I'll credit that uh, to that, Spencer Eccles Jr. <laughs> that, that we have this ability to come and talk, and it doesn't mean that we always agree, but, mm -hmm. but we talk and we work through issues. And uh, I, I remember, as I'm sure you do, working on those initial Utah Leads Together plans where we, we actually had a plan and it changed over time, but we had an initial plan out by the end of March. To me, that's mind boggling that we could put together something like that that quickly. And then similarly, uh, you know, dealing with the state budget and the other issues that we had to work through, that we were able to come together quickly. We went to market, uh, you know, I was doing rating agency meetings in April because we had decided what our economic plan was going to be moving forward. And so that's one very important piece of it, is that social cohesion that we have here in the state, that, that we need to make sure that, that we preserve and protect and continue to build up. We can't take that for granted because it could change over time. Uh, the second thing I want to bring up is that I think we're big enough to have some degree of sophistication, but small enough to still be nimble. The, the, that we have kind of, to, kind of to Sophia's point of we have this ability to do things quickly partly because of our size where if we're a state the size of California maybe it's harder to get something like that done that quickly but I attribute those two factors to yeah. to our response. Yeah, love that, Phil. Phil, I want to stay with you for just a second and then uh, I'll kind of percolate it out to the other panelists. but. Uh, one of the things that we need to talk about is how is the economy different as we come out of this? And usually in economic parlance, we would call those what's structurally different, not the ebb and flow of the business cycle, but what's, what's shifted below our feet? And do you mind just teeing that off? Yeah, so a couple of things that I think of, I think the pandemic in many ways accelerated these structural trends that were already taking place. So if you look at teleworking, for example, like, at, at the state level, we had dipped our toes into that and had a pilot program that we had rolled out and we were expanding the pilot program. And then overnight, we had 40% of the state workforce teleworking. Uh, I think that's a permanent change that's here. I don't think it'll stay, uh, I know at the state level, the plan is to continue it throughout the broader business community. Probably some of that comes back somewhat but I don't think entirely. I think that's one of those long-term structural changes uh, in how we do business, like who had been on a Zoom or Teams call or whatever. Like I think I'd been on one or two before March of last year. I'd certainly never set one up. Um, you know, fundamental changes that are now just part of how we, how we do business. Uh, it will be interesting to me to see how the travel and tourism sector recovers and if people do change their habits. Uh, I look here again in Utah specifically where we have state park visitation up at massive levels, you know, double in some cases where it was last year. Or you look at trails around the state. Uh, I think it'll probably come back some from where it was this year because we'll have other opportunities outside the state. But I also think some of those trends, people have rediscovered places they had forgotten about and I think that's another trend that's going to continue, that outdoor recreation is going to continue to be a growing and, and strong part of the state's economy. Mm. Dan, what do you think uh, the next economy looks like? How is it different? How is it the same? I, I think Phil hit on a lot of these things uh, well. One thing I would add with the, 
I, I think there is going to be more teleworking. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some industries will be permanently changed, permanently mm -hmm. down, if I can. Other mm -hmm. industries will continue to grow. And um, and as, as Phil said, I think we saw more of an acceleration of trends already in place. One, one thing I do think that people will pay more attention to that we sometimes don't think of when we think of, you know, economic development or economy is quality of life. I think more people will, will spend more time thinking about quality of life and valuing quality of life in particular if they're able to work from home, telework, they're going to be more thoughtful about what's, what can I go do that's around me and how is that impacting my quality of life as much as work and jobs. Yeah. Sophia, do you want to comment? Sure. Yeah. I just, I, I think in addition to what's already been stated, uh, the way we purchase goods and services has changed. And I think a lot of that is uh, going to be permanent. The way we think about buying food, the way we um, do entertainment even. A lot, of, uh, a lot of events were heavily impacted by the pandemic and were able to find a way to continue their events virtually, for example. And I think we'll see um, some flexibility with some events being available electronically as well as in person. And so um, I, I think we'll see some of that evolve, uh, but have a, a permanence as well. Mm -hmm. Sylvia, do you want to comment on the structural or how the economy might be different moving forward? I think there's going to be a bigger emphasis on workforce development. One of the things that became really clear, especially with everybody going home and trying to work online, it's how many, how different segments of the population that was not an option. Whether they were in rural communities, whether they were multicultural communities, a lot of them did not have an option. They did not have a job that allowed them to do that. And some of, uh, some of those jobs that they were doing before, they're not going to come back the way they used to be um, pre-pandemic. And I think it's going to be a reality that we look at how do we enhance the skills? How do we work with this um, segment of the population to ensure that we take this as an opportunity to maybe give them the skills, the resources, the training to move them into better paying industries, into different types of opportunities. So I think it, this could also be a huge opportunity for the state in terms of looking at how do we enhance our workforce. Mm -hmm. During my remarks, kind of summarizing what the economic community had put into the economic report, I, I highlighted three areas of concern, uh, air quality, equality of opportunity, and housing affordability. I want to ask our panelists, would you add anything to that list, or would you like to comment on any of those three? So air quality, equality of opportunity, and housing affordability. Those are what I'm seeing as big challenges that we need our, our uh, leaders to pay attention to, and you'll note that Basically, every one of them deals with growth. Who wants to go first? Well, I can go first and get it be done. <laughs> um, I, I think one thing that I would would add to that, in it's education. Mm -hmm. It's always an issue, always will be an issue, uh, and and workforce training is is part of that. But it's primary education preparing students for an economy of tomorrow, not an economy of yesterday, and that's going to continue has always been in Utah and will continue to be and need to be an area of focus an area where we're willing to look at change and embrace change. Dan, I'm so glad you added that and mentioned that. I, one of my favorite public policy quotes is a George H.W. Bush quote where he says, every public policy issue, if you peel it back, ends at education or begins at education. Okay, who else wants to, to add something to the list, comment on it, Sophia? Yeah, I would add to the list infrastructure. Uh, there was a lot of talk in the last panel about that as well, but there there are some major infrastructure needs, and we really do need to think about how do we fa finance water, uh, how how do we finance a multimodal transportation system in the state, uh, and and you know how do we make sure that when you go visit a park, you're having a good experience and not an experience that won't bring you back to the park. For example, uh, I think that's going to be a, a big. Uh, challenge, but also an opportunity that we have to address. Mm. I've told a lot of people who work closely with me, but I went down to the inauguration and decided to make a little jaunt over to Zion's. Nobody does that anymore, but I tried. Husband and I wanted to hike Angel's Landing. Uh, the entire scenic drive was closed. They were turning hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of vehicles away. 
after you'd paid to enter the park, they just sent you up to Mount Carmel and whatnot, and I just thought, this is not right. It, it's not that you shouldn't be turned away, but something's wrong about that experience. Okay, who, anyone else want to comment, to add to the list? Phil, it looks like you're hopping so to go. I, I just want to follow up on one of those that you did have on your list, housing. Like, uh, to me, it seems like we've made good steps in air quality and, and have a continued path there. Uh, I know certainly in, in Governor Cox and his administration, the opportunity for all theme, that, that you're going to continue to see that emphasized. Uh, my biggest worry about maybe feeling like we don't fully have a direction is housing. And it's, if I were to think about the single greatest risk to Utah's long-term economy, it is that housing issue. And I think we have made some positive steps, but we still have a long ways to go, that we still have the 50,000 or whatever units it is that were short uh, over the past decade. And I don't see a clear direction mm -hmm. on how we're gonna do that. I, th I think we need some significant changes there. Yeah, that's a really important comment because what I hear you saying, Phil, is that we don't know how we're gonna solve this problem. And uh, it's a tough one because just when your children can't get into homes, then they're renting. When they're renting, they're also putting up the rental prices. Everything is more expensive, and life is more difficult for everybody. Uh, Sylvia, let's let you bring home, and then I'm going to come to each of you, and I'm going to ask you this question, and I'm wondering if I should surprise you with it or give you some lead time. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask each of you to pick one word that describes the Utah economy in 2020 and 2021. So you get two words each, Sylvia, but you get to go first on this on this question if you want to add anything to the list. So we've had housing, we've had education, we've had infrastructure, I had air quality on the list, uh, and equal opportunity. I think I kind of want to add on to the equal opportunity. I, uh, as the state grows, as the diversity of the state grows, is something that cannot longer be ignored. Also, it's something that will make a difference on whether or not companies move into the state. As they compare us to other nearby cities, how do we compare in our workforce? How are they um, approach? How are they able to, to grow within a company? And I think that's going to be a bigger deal in the years to come. Mm. Okay, so the hardest on this is to be the last person because some of the words are taken. And I'm gonna let Phil take that and go to Dan first. And it's because, Phil, you helped author the report. So, uh, Dan, one word to describe the economy in 2020 and then 2021. Do I get to talk about my word or is it just my word done? You, you go for it. Okay. It's up to you. I'm gonna say resilient okay. for 2020. It was artificially propped up as far as from numbers on a spreadsheet perspective, but yeah. the people in Utah have been very resilient mm -hmm. and have worked through this and and that's going to lead me to my 2021 word which is opportunity. Okay. We have an opportunity to move forward as a state to embrace the natural changes that have been that have occurred due to the pandemic as Phil talked about and it's an opportunity. Great. Okay, Sophia, resilience and opportunity. What do you want to go with? challenging for 2020 and that's probably a soft word for what it really was but yeah. yes challenging uh and dan did take my idea for 2021 uh, so okay. i had to hurry and come up with another one uh and i would say evolution we are gonna have to evolve love it very good i hope someone's tweeting this okay sylvia and i'm like damn you took mine too i'm like crap <laughs> i think as we look at 2020 i uh, one of the things that I want to say it's strong. I think 2020 really proved to us how strong we can be. We have overcome a lot of challenges and a lot of things that we never thought we could possibly do. And we have just um, dealt with them face on and continue. For 2021, I, I, the word I would think of is actually hope. Mm. I think we're all hoping that 2021 will be our turning point. That now that we have a vaccine and it's getting rolled out that fortunately we can really think about not longer this pandemic but also think about how do we just overcome and um, and just basically make up time for what has happened great Phil so for 2020 I'm gonna go with surprising yes okay uh, and I'm tempted to cheat on 2021 and say like 
oportunidad or something like that <laughs> in Spanish. Uh, but I think I'll go for rally. I heard nice. that term earlier today, and I think that's a very good word to describe where I think we'll be rallying from the challenge that was 2020. That's great. Ladies and gentlemen, our economic panel, thanks everyone for your interest.